first down, they hand off to Marlon Mack. Huge hole, 50-yard line. He's at the 40, still going near sideline. He's at the 10, he's at the 5, and he will score. Touchdown, Marlon Mack. Touchdown, I-N-D-Y. And again, it's picked off. It's Darius Leonard. Leonard with a second INT, and he's streaking down the near sideline. He's at the 40, he's at the 30, he's at the 20. He's going to go. A pick six for the Maniac. Horseshoe is back, baby. The horseshoe is back. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bring the Juice podcast. I'm your host, Cody Felger. Joining me, friend of the show, my other co-host on Colts Brawl, Mr. Michael Terrazas. Michael, how are you doing down there, man? Uh, I know you live in Texas, and I'm up here in Indiana, and it's pretty darn hot out. How are you handling the weather down there right now? I'm assuming it's probably over 100 degrees. How are you holding up, my friend? Oh, man, dude. This is uh, the Texas weather, man. It's like no other. You know, I'm yeah. staying cool. Uh, my, my new job involves me sweating a lot. So, I mean, at least I'm staying cool somewhat. Uh, but man, well, for the most part, man, just uh, just feeling blessed, man. Just turned uh, 22 years old. I feel feel good for how far you know God's allowed me to go, and you know just can't go anywhere without Him. So I'm I'm feeling good right now. Good man, yeah. Happy belated birthday. I know that was yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Michael. I don't know if you've been following along, but what we've been doing these last you know few days, you know, basically this last week. We've been looking at the different position groups on the Colts. We've been focusing solely on the offense. So, you know, we started with the quarterbacks then we talked about the running backs. We talked about the wide receivers. And most recently, we just looked at the tight ends. But I wanted to look at a group that's probably the biggest strength on this Colts offense. It's been the biggest strength the last two years. And that's the offensive line. Now, the offensive line, you know, this one probably has the most investment out of any of these position groups on the offense in terms of draft capital that the Colts have used to acquire these guys. And so um, I thought we could look at, you know, I know the Colts typically carry probably eight to 10 more so on the nine to 10 uh, guys on the offensive line, because obviously, you know, stuff happens and you need depth. You need guys to come in and step in. So I thought today we could kind of look at nine guys that I think, legitimately and there could be a surprise it seems like there always is but I want to look at nine guys who I think legitimately have a shot at making this final 53-man roster I'm going to say the Colts are going to carry nine they very well could carry eight or very well could carry ten but nine I think is a good number to kind of look at here and so we'll start by looking at all five starters and then we'll talk about some of those reserve guys as well and I'm going to start on the left side the guy who's been on the Colts since 2011, the left tackle, he's been rock solid. He's actually had some of his best seasons the last few years. Uh, that's Anthony Costanzo out of Boston College. I mean, he's been a guy, Michael, that's, you know, besides that 2018 season, he's been a guy that's played pretty much 16 games his entire career besides his rookie year. He's just been a rock on that left side. I mean, he's had to deal with so many different quarterbacks, similar to kind of how T.Y. Hilton has had to catch passes from so many quarterbacks. He's had to protect the blind side of so many quarterbacks, and he's done a fantastic job. Um, I know another guy that was drafted, you know, in that same draft by the Patriots, Nate, Nate Solder. He's on a different team now, but Anthony Costanzo has stayed with the Colts. It, he probably will be a Colt for life. He's just a fantastic player in his own right. He's an elite run blocker, and he's gotten a lot better in the pass protection department. Uh, Michael, give me your thoughts here on a guy like Anthony Costanzo, kind of the veteran of this offensive line group. Yeah, I mean, this is a no-brainer. Um, he's going to make the roster. He's going to be the starter. No one's debating that right now. For the most part, man, the biggest thing for Anthony Costanzo is going to be, like like, like I've said on some others, you know, in the past, he, he's had a couple injuries, but nothing major. Nothing major. Yeah, I really hope it's going to be a clean year for him. And, man, there's there's really not a whole lot to say about Anthony Costanzo because I mean, he's not a project in the works. He's not, he, we know what he is and he's a pretty darn good (laughs) offensive tackle. So being like the blind, the blind side protection of Phillip rivers, Jacoby Brissett or Jacob Eason, whatever the case may be, it's going to be big because he's the most experienced lineman on that team. 
probably after Phillip Rivers is the most experienced player on that team. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, man, he he's just going to be an anchor like he always has. He's going to be the leader of that team, the, that uh, unit. And, I mean, like I said, there's not a whole lot to say on him, but we already know what he's going to be. Yeah, I wonder how much of a sigh of relief – Philip Rivers had when he signed at Indy and, and realized he had an elite protector in Anthony Costanzo. I mean, just coming from what Rivers has had with the Chargers, that's just got to be a breath of fresh air just, just to realize, oh, man, I don't have to worry about my blind side all the time. Anthony Costanzo's got me. Uh, that's certainly, if I was a quarterback, I would really be able to sleep well at night if knowing that I have that kind of guy, you know, protecting my blind side. So, Anthony Costanzo, great left tackle. He's only gotten better with age. He's kind of like fine wine, man. He, he keeps getting better as he's getting older. You know, last year, Anthony Costanzo said, honestly, I feel the best that I felt since I was drafted. And so there should be, you know, at least three, four more years of elite left tackle play from Anthony Costanzo. So that's certainly exciting. And then we can look over to his right side, the left guard, Quentin Nelson. Uh, another first-round pick. So Costanzo was picked in the first round in 2011. Quentin Nelson, obviously, part of that historic 2018 draft where the Colts traded from three to six, acquired a ton of picks, still got their guy in Quentin Nelson. And, Michael, he's not only established himself as the best guard in football, he established himself as the best offensive lineman in football and one of the best players in football. I mean, this is a guy you just you just kind of look at what he's done since he's been with the Colts. And I know people, uh, you can't really evaluate a ton of stats for offensive linemen, but that, you know, I've always been told if your name's not really called, that's usually a good thing. But Quentin Nelson kind of has changed that because his name's been called for doing incredible things on that offensive line, you know, pancaking guys and just really changing the culture of that Colts offensive line that if you remember a year before he was drafted, the Colts had the worst offensive line in the league. They led the league in sacks allowed. Their running game was not very good. And then Anthony, and then you know, Quentin Nelson comes in alongside Anthony Costanzo, and he just completely, you know, with others, helps change the culture of that offensive line. You know, kind of throwing it back to those Peyton Manning days. Like they take pride in protecting their quarterback. They take pride in running the ball down other teams' throats. And Quentin Nelson is certainly a guy that wants to do that, and he wants to. I know I've seen a quote from him. He wants to take the will away from a defender. And he just really has changed that mindset. And I honestly think he's elevated the game, helped elevate the game of Anthony Costanzo and then of Ryan Kelly, the center, who we'll get to in a second. But, man, Michael, talk to me about Quentin Nelson and just how much he means to this Colts offensive line and just to this Colts team in general. Man, Cody, it's hard to say anything. I mean, you're taking all my points, man. (laughs) Uh, But – Man, Quentin Nelson, you know, going into that draft of 2018, I was, you know, I was confused uh, of where the Colts were going to head because, you know, I was looking at Quentin Nelson or Bradley Chubb. I was also looking at Quentin Nelson's teammate, um, McGlitchkey, I think that's his yeah, last Mike, name. Mike McGlinchy, yeah. Yeah, Mike McGlinchy. And I was thinking, oh, we could use a tackle maybe on the right side or maybe – um, you know, uh, switch with Anthony Costanzo. I was looking at those, but when I saw that the Colts took Quentin Nelson, I I wasn't that heavily involved into the draft as I am now. But man, I just knew that he was going to be a game game changer. I mean, that dude mm-hmm. plays like a dang linebacker type offensive lineman, and what I mean by that is. He's willing to do anything when it when it comes to contact with a defender. He is willing to do anything. He will cut block you. He will literally just outright push you with his arm, shoulder you, whatever the case may be. That attitude has not only just changed this, this offensive line. It's changed this organization. It's changed, you know, that... That good vibe, that attitude, that changes you. And he's the guy that spearheads run the damn ball. He literally goes to Frank Reich on the sideline and says, hey, I want you to run the football. We need to run the football. And when when you have a guy like that who you see is literally begging 
you to run the football so he can get his hands on someone. That is that just tells you he's ready to not rip someone's head off. Mm-hmm. His work ethic, his strength, everything you see on the offensive line. And like you said, it's elevated Costanzo, it's elevated uh Kelly. But for Quentin Nelson, he does a lot of things really well in that run game. Because when you're going in between the A and B gaps, Quentin Nelson is taking out one or two guys every time. Every time. And the way he pulls, dude, that, that's one thing I think don't, doesn't get said about Quentin Nelson too much, is that he is very athletic for an offensive lineman. The way he pulls, how fast he pulls, is just incredible. It is incredible. And that he mm-hmm. is a big reason for why the running game is where it is and where it's going to go in 2020. Yeah. I don't know if you read the story from the Indy, Indy Star about Quentin Nelson last year going into that Kansas City game. Um, so basically, Chris Ballard was talking um, on a podcast with uh, NFL Network, uh, Lance Zerline, and he was basically talking about the week to that Kansas City game Nelson was just destroying some practice squad defensive linemen in practice. And he is a vocal, he was a very vocal guy about that. I mean, he was telling, he was basically telling his GM, Chris Ballard, right? The guy that drafted him. He said, we're playing Chris Jones and you got a 230 pound defensive end on the scout team. And he's shouting at Ballard. He said, how am I supposed to get better? And I don't know. It's just wild to think about, you know, just any player, especially a guy, you know, who was that highly touted and, you know, we know is just so great in character. And he's, he's not afraid to call out the highest person in the organization besides Jim Ursay and tell him, what are you doing? And I think that, man, that is a mindset that we saw, you know, we didn't see at all, you know, in the Andrew Luck era. I mean, we saw it with Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning was not afraid to be vocal and call out things that needed to be called out. But, I mean, you look at that, you know, through those years, nobody said anything really on the team about just the lack of accountability. And Quentin Nelson's a guy, man, he is not shy about saying, we're not doing, you know, we need to do this. And he's not ashamed to to even call out his bosses. It's kind of wild to me, but it's kind of awesome as well. Yeah. You got a guy like Quentin Nelson who's not afraid to speak his mind if he feels like something's not going well. I think that's just got to serve this team so well to have a leader like that in Quentin Nelson who's unafraid to do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we can move on now to the guy I already talked about briefly, Ryan Kelly, the center, another first round pick. So you have a slew of first round picks on this left side and now moving to the center. Ryan Kelly out of Alabama. Uh, he's a guy that was drafted in 2016 and he, you know, he's been a really good center for the Colts overall. I know, you know, kind of starting his career, he had a pretty solid season in 2016, but he's kind of been there in kind of the rough days of the Colts offensive line, right? He came in 2016, he's played in 2016, 2017, and then he was there for 2018. And, uh, you know, he's, he's had a few years there, 20. 2017 and 2018 where he didn't play in all 16 games but last year he did he played in all 16 games which I think is huge he's looking to get extended this year I think honestly he developed himself especially this last year as a top five center in this league Um, Michael just kind of from a leadership standpoint and also just from you know a position standpoint talk to me about a guy like Ryan Kelly and what he means to the Colts offensive line Oh, man, to to hell with a top five uh, center. He's a top three center in my mind. He has Mm -hmm. elevated his game so much further than when he was at Alabama. Uh, This is when uh, Ryan Grigson was the general manager, and the offensive line was a complete nightmare. And heading into the draft, I think it shouldn't – it's probably one of the very few draft choices – Ryan Grigson made. Um, it wouldn't even surprise me if it came out that Jim Ursay made the pick and not Ryan Grigson. But <laughs> right, Ryan Kelly ha- is a guy that doesn't get talked about all that much. He doesn't. He does. He is the quiet guy. But I can tell 
he's like he he's almost like Quentin Nelson's best friend because they mirror each other so much. One is the loud mouth, one is quiet. But they both have the same mean streak in them. He came in and was thrown into a very poor situation on the offensive line. He added some stability up the middle, but not all that much. But now when you get two quality guards next to him, you're able to see what he can do. He can get to the second level much better, much better. And he's very strong, very strong. Ryan Kelly for the center man, to be honest, I honestly thought that he would probably change to like, a guard or something. And this was like early on when he was drafted. I don't know why I was thinking that, but I'm really, really pleased with Ryan Kelly because he was the first guy on that offensive line to, to be drafted to help out Anthony Costanzo. And we can move to the right guard position. Mark Glowinski, probably the guy that I know a lot of fans will say is the weak link of this offensive line. Not that he's bad. I think he's probably an average right guard, but he was a guy that initially one of the only guys on this offensive line that wasn't drafted by the Colts. He was a guy that initially was with Seattle uh, for a couple of years. And then he signed with the Colts in 2018. I believe he was a waiver claim for the Colts. And uh, you know, you mentioned it when, when injuries happen in that new England game and uh, you know, Matt Slauson goes down, Mark Lewinsky has to go play right guard. And honestly, I, I feel like he hasn't been, as bad as a lot of people have said, obviously last year I feel like was his weaknesses were more amplified because of the poor quarterback play. And we know Jacoby Brissett for whatever reason has trouble sometimes just getting rid of the ball when he needs to get rid of the ball, holding on to it. This we saw that with Andrew Luck a little bit as well um, early on in his career. But, you know, I feel like Mark Golinski is a quality starter at right guard. You could, I mean, you could obviously upgrade from him, but it's not the most pressing need to upgrade from him right now. Uh, what are your thoughts on a guy like Mark Glowinski, Michael? If there was any kind of debate on this offensive line, it would be the right guard position. Because, li- like you said, his weaknesses were exposed a little bit. Uh, like I've said previously on the Colts Brawl on my show, when it came to the zone right, the zone left uh, runs, when it came to the right, those were automatically snuffed out. They weren't going anywhere. And looking at film, I saw that Mark Glowinski could not keep his hands on anyone. He couldn't. Uh, The speed there, you know, he was just a little bit slower than his defenders. And his strength, I don't really think his strength is where he needs to be as a right guard. And if there's ever any debate, is Mark Glowinski – going to start this year I definitely think he's going to be on the roster obviously but is he going to start you know Danny Pinter a guy who are who a lot of people are are high on I think he has a good shot to go after Mark Lewinsky because on this offensive line you you need speed Brian Kelly has it Braden Smith has it Quentin Nelson obviously has it. Anthony Costanzo they got it for Glowinski. I really want to see how they battle it out and what the reps look like in the preseason because that gives you a good indicator of what things are going to look like for the season. Now, Glowinski, I'm not sure if there's any kind of a trade market for a right guard. I think those are just the guys that you just have to let walk. But I honestly, early before training camp, I would label him as a vet cut. You know, as a guy, a veteran who's going to get cut. Uh, before the final roster is announced, I honestly think that he is a candidate to get cut. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like, honestly, I feel like he's going to keep his spot this year. I don't know. I, I just feel like, you know, as good as Danny Pinter is, how high the Colts are on him, he mm-hmm. still needs time to develop. I mean, he wasn't coming out of, you know, a SEC school or anything of that nature nope. like Braden Smith was and, you know, Quentin Nelson obviously playing against some of the best defensive linemen in the league in, in college football. And so, I don't know. For me, Danny Pinter is probably a guy that needs maybe a year or two to develop a little bit more, you know, get stronger, continue to develop his game. Because, I mean, really, he's not that far removed from just from being a tight end. 
he was a tight end coming into Ball State, and then he obviously transitioned to offensive tackle, and now he's transitioning again to more of the interior. So I don't know. For me, I feel like you know Mark Galinsky is obviously not a long term piece for you at right guard, but I feel like he can be a serviceable piece right now, a decent yeah. veteran at the on that right Solid. side. He's not awful. Like I think a lot of people think he's just like you know. I'm trying to think some of those offensive linemen the Colts had in 2017, like Samson uh, Satelli. No, not Samson. That was earlier on. I'm trying to think the offensive guard that was there the year before Quentin Nelson was drafted. He was like the worst in the NFL. Oh crap, his name is escaping me. But it wasn't know, Todd Harriman's, was it? No, no, no. This was oh crap. I forget his name. Jeremy Vujnovic. That's the name. Uh, Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So bad. But he's not like that level, not even close to that level. But he is, you know, when you look at a top five offensive line, you know, probably the top offensive line, honestly, you know, there's going to be a weak link on every offensive line. And I think he's a weak link. And that just tells you how good this offensive line is if an average right guard is your biggest weak link on that offensive line. So certainly could be replaced, but I feel like, you know, the Colts just extended him uh, previous to. Uh, the 2019 season. And so he's got a couple of years left on that contract. I feel like he's a solid depth piece. Even if you do find a guy, if Danny Pinter or somebody else comes into training camp and takes that position away, he's still a guy that, you know, you can build some quality depth with on that offensive line. So I think Mark Golinski is probably going to make this roster. I just think, you know, you do, you just always want more depth on an offensive line. And so certainly keeping a guy like Golinski around till his contract's up wouldn't be the worst option in the world. We can move over now to the last guy on this starting five offensive line, uh, Braden Smith, right tackle. He was also drafted in that 2018 draft. He was drafted in the second round, initially was drafted as a guard. And I know he didn't really play a ton uh, early on into 2018, but, you know, eventually injuries happened on that right side of the offensive line. Braden Smith had to step in there at right tackle. Mark Lewinsky, obviously, they, yeah, they basically, Braden Smith had to play right tackle and he hasn't relented that since he, he played in 13, he started in 13 games that year. And then 2019, he started all 16 games. Talk to me real fast about a guy like Braden Smith, who you talk about underappreciated guys. I think he's one of those guys who is vastly underappreciated by a lot of people, but he's been a really solid right tackle for the Colts. He's a hidden gem for the Colts. You know, one of one of many uh, excellent draft choices by Chris Ballard. And he was actually brought in to be a right guard. He was brought in and he was drafted to be a right guard. In 2018, they had a lot of injuries. I believe it was the Thursday night game with New England, and yep. they had uh, quite a few injuries. Braden Smith had to go to right tackle. He had to. And Chris Ballard even talked about it. He said that, you know, the plan for him to be a right tackle was not – that was not in our plans leading up to the draft. And we had to throw him out there because we had no one else. And reviewing that film, we saw that he did really good. And from then on, you have your right tackle. He has been really good. I mean, you talk about his rookie year. I mean, the, the biggest name that he probably went up against was Demarcus Lawrence from the Cowboys. And he completely shut him down completely he didn't even touch Andrew Luck because Braden Smith had him on lockdown for Braden Smith I mean there, there's really not going to be anyone challenging for his for his job um you know no one's going to challenge for his job he, he he'll have it the biggest thing for me is is he done developing oh not developing is he done getting better is this the best that he can do you know I honestly think that he he will actually become one of the better tackles in the game. But there is like a thought in my head that kind of scares me a little bit is that, you know, you got guys like Ryan Kelly who you're going to extend. You're going to obviously extend uh, Quentin Nelson. You could possibly uh, sign a tackle after Anthony Costanzo leaves. You got contracts to hand out. Is Braden Smith one of those guys that you just have to let walk? I mean, for, for his production, I think he's earning himself a pretty good contract. But for the future, man, it, it kind of worries me a little bit. I'm not going to lie. It kind of worries me. Braden Smith is 
he's been very underrated. I mean, you don't you hear more talk about Mark Lewinsky than you hear than you do Braden Smith. So for Braden Smith, it's just about keeping your job. That's it. No, no one's gonna take his job that that I can see. So that that's all I have for Braden Smith. Yeah. That'll do it for the really the five offensive linemen that we think probably will start here in 2020. Now we can look at a couple of reserve guys that could potentially, you know, some of them could potentially challenge. Some of them probably will just be backups. And I'll start with a guy that's been here the longest. Um, I mentioned him earlier, the backup to Anthony Costanzo, LaRaven Clark, the former third round pick, actually taken that same draft in 2016 as Ryan Kelly. Um, he's been He's interesting. He's a very interesting prospect because he's got a lot of the physical tools to potentially be a good tackle in this league. But he just, for some reason, he's struggled with, you know, he doesn't really have a lot of mean streak in him. Um, he's just kind of struggled overall with consistency. I don't know. He, I mean, I don't know how I feel about if Anthony Costanza was to miss some time having the Raven Clark back out there because I feel like since he was drafted, he hasn't really developed a ton like you would like for him. But, you know, obviously when you lose two interior offensive linemen and Joe Haig and Josh Andrews, you need to bring back somebody for offensive line depth. So LaRaven Clark's back at offensive tackle. What are your thoughts on a guy like LaRaven Clark, Michael? Yeah, I think LaRaven Clark is a very interesting player. I'm surprised that he's still on the roster. When he was drafted, he was actually pretty he, – he, he was he was well-known. He was highly touted. He, he was a respectable prospect, especially for the third – I believe he was drafted in the third round. And yeah. he came in needing to be a serviceable, pe- serviceable piece. He has played some games, and he has not lived up to the hype at all. Uh, he has had some horrible grades. He's played awful. And if it wasn't for Joe Haig, you know, signing with Tampa Bay, I'd honestly think, you know, the Raven Clark's not even a Colt anymore. Mm-hmm. He, he was kept, you know, by those contracts uh, Chris Ballard handed out. But I, I really don't see how the Raven Clark – you know, is still on the roster. Maybe it was a desperation signing by Chris Ballard. He needed someone on the roster. You just got to get bodies in. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure he will make the 53 because I don't know any other tackles that are going to challenge him for that spot. But all I got to say is, Anthony Costanzo, please stay healthy because <laughs> – Right. I just haven't I haven't seen any development. I haven't seen any improvement from the Raven Clark. I, I haven't. I haven't. He I don't I don't know. You know, he was a uh well known prospect coming out when he was drafted, but all of that has just gone downhill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean he's six five, three sixteen, so he's got the all ideal offensive tackle, you know, size and all that stuff, but for whatever reason he's just had a heck of a time. Um, adjusting to the NFL level. So, yeah, like you said, Anthony Costanzo, please stay healthy. You know, odds are he will stay healthy, but <laughs> LaRaven Clark's not the most exciting backup left tackle to have. Um, you're not super excited to see what he brings because we've already seen really awful things that he has brought. Um, we can move on. A guy that the Colts drafted this year, uh, fifth-round pick, Danny Pinter. Um, this is a guy that out of Ball State, so he's a local product. He obviously started at, at tight end at Ball State, and then he transitioned. He played offensive tackle at Ball State, but the Colts felt like Danny Pinter would be more serviceable and you know better at the NFL level in the interior. Now, Michael, what are your thoughts on a guy like Danny Pinter? I know you mentioned it earlier. You think he could potentially challenge for that right guard spot. What are some things that you like about Danny Pinter? Well, I did say a little bit earlier, he's an athletic guy. That's that's the big thing. When I look at some pretty good offensive linemen, they seem to have a pretty good athleticism to them. The speed, it helps them, okay? The agilities, it helps the offensive linemen greatly. For Danny Pinter, he is probably going to be the best reserve for the Colts. He could fill in at center, I, I'd imagine, at left guard, right guard for whoever – 
may uh, suffer an injury. I envision him taking a lot of reps in training camp, taking a lot of reps at center, left guard, right guard. Now, I do believe his true position was left guard in college. But obviously, we have Quentin Nelson. A move to right guard, that that is completely doable because you look at Mark Glowinski, and like you said, he's a good piece for right now. But for the future, we got to we gotta think bigger. For Danny Pinter, like I said, he's going to be the best reserve on the team. And there's not really a whole lot to say about him because he's a rookie. We haven't seen him perform or go up against any kind of people. But for me, it's going to be about where his best fit is. You know, is he going to be a better center than he is a guard? Is he going to be a better left guard than he is a right guard? You know, those are some things that we still haven't uh, found out yet. And we're going to find out in training camp. But I am really hoping for Danny Pinter to pan out really well for the Colts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I believe he was an offensive tackle at Ball State, and the Colts had decided to move him inside. Um, Mm, We can look at another another guy here. Um, A guy that's actually been talked about a decent amount and a guy that I didn't really know about um, before I started, you know, kind of looking into him a little bit. Jake Eldrenkamp. Uh, he's listed at a center where I'm looking, but he can play kind of that interior as well. He's 26 years old. Um, he's a guy that, you know, I don't know a ton about. I'm not sure, Michael, how much you know about Jake Eldrin Camp, but seems like there are some people who are kind of high on him. Um, he's 26 mm-hmm. years old, so he's still fairly, fairly young. Um, he's a little bit undersized. I mean, he's 6'5", but he's 284. So not the typical offensive line size that you're looking for, but maybe that means he's a lot more athletic than some of these guys. What are your thoughts on a guy like Jake Eldrin camp? Yeah. For the weight 284 as an interior guy, as, as a tackle, you know, that that'd be fine with me. But if you're going to be an interior offensive lineman, you're going up against 300 pound defensive tackles, you know, Um, so I would definitely want to see that weight get up. I don't know too much about Eldrin Kemp, but I do know, like you said, there were some guys that were high on him. You know, Chris Ballard, I believe he was signed during the season last year, right? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I'm I'm pretty sure. I I, I I feel like I heard his name, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think he was, and Chris Ballard was high on him. He, as soon as he hit the waiver wire, you know, Chris Ballard, he – he put in the note and for him, you know, like I said, I don't know too much about him, but I do know that when it comes to the reserves on the Colts offensive line, uh, there's some limited pieces, but for elder camp, it's going to be about solidifying himself for a reserve spot. Because if I'm being honest, I think the Colts will carry eight linemen this year. Uh, You know, possibly another guy that we're about to talk about. But for eight guys, I think that's a pretty good – it's a pretty good number for eight because when I look at other Mm -hmm. positions, you might want to keep more at those positions than you do the offensive line since that's your strongest unit. For Eldrin Camp, it's just going to be about make the roster. Just just make the roster. I think his best fit will be most likely probably at a center position. So possibly – you know, to fill those Josh Andrews shoes, it's going to be, uh, we're going to see. It's going to take some time. Yeah, absolutely. The last guy we'll look at here that I wanted to talk about, a guy we have not seen yet, but he was drafted in the 2019 draft in the seventh round mm-hmm. out of Mississippi, Javon Patterson. This is a guy that we obviously didn't see because he tore, I believe he tore his ACL last year. So Mm -hmm. he missed the entire 2019 season, but, you know, talking about interior needs, I mean, the Colts really have some needs on that offensive interior, just guys that, you know, can be solid pieces, especially after losing two quality guys to free agency. But you throw in a guy like Patterson, who we don't know a ton about, but I mean, he's got decent size, 6'3", 308. He's only 22 years old, so he's still young. He's got fairly good upside. What are your thoughts on a guy like Javon Patterson and maybe his chances to make this roster and, and help this Colts reserve offensive line? You know, I was actually high on him coming out of the draft because I because I did like him. He showed me some good stuff at Mississippi, and obviously that's in the SEC, and he, 
he held his own against some guys there. Now the ACL was a was a killer for him. Coming back, it's going to be about that agility in those legs and those hips uh, as a tackle position. And he's a guy that I'm kind of hoping could possibly take uh, that spot from the Raven Clark, hopefully. But coming off the ACL, I, I don't know. But he is still fairly young, still fairly young, just like a Julian Blackman. So he could heal pretty quickly. It was last year. I'm really high on Javon Patterson, if I'm being honest, because when I saw him at Mississippi, you know, just his his build, his foundation, his his core, it was just, it was strong. I liked what I saw, and I was kind of surprised he went in the seventh round. I thought he would have been a fifth-round pick. But for him to go to the seventh round and obviously, you know, suffer injury last year, I'm really curious to see how he bounces back this year because it's going to be a battle for that uh, backup left tackle position. And I think he should uh, want to compete for that. You know, this is another guy who's going to be the odd man out between the Raven Clark or Javon Patterson. I honestly think it's going to come down to those two guys hmm. because if you're going to be the lone tackle, you got to be able to fill in at both. And the Raven Clark has played left tackle and right tackle. Javon Patterson, he he went a little bit in high school. I believe he was a right tackle mainly at um, – no, a left tackle in high school, played a little bit of both in college. So it's going to be about, you know, Chris Ballard likes those guys to be versatile on everywhere on the field. So mm-hmm. it's going to be a, a pretty good competition there between those two. Yeah. Uh, Do you think he's a guy, because I know he came out of college. I think he was a center at Mississippi, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe he's had some experience kind of everywhere on this offensive line. Yeah. Um, Do you think he's a guy that could kind of be, you know, Joe Haig type with, you know, just a Swiss army knife, if you will, of offensive line. Like he can kind of play anywhere, kind of plug and play wherever you need him. Do you think he's kind of that type of mold as well? I do. I do. I, I honestly like him at tackle better than I do center which is I didn't mention center because I think that's not, I guess you could say, in the cards uh, as, mm. as a reserve role. Yeah, sure. But I really like his potential on the outside because I did see some good things. And, man, it's, it's going to be hard. This is yeah. for the reserve spots. It's always hard to compare, to do apples to oranges, especially when there's been no kind of practices. So Right. Uh, that that's what's so hard about this time, but with Patterson, I think he can be a Joe Hague type guy. Uh, just play everywhere on the field because that's what's gonna earn him, give him a better chance at making this roster. Mm-hmm. All righty, well that'll wrap up our look at the Colts' offensive line. If you guys have any other guys who you think could potentially challenge for a final fifty-three man roster spot, let us know in the comments. But for Michael and myself, thank you guys for listening as always. And as always, go Colts.